Okay, this video is called Study Skills or Advanced Study Skills for Homeschool and for Hedgerow Schools. Hedgerow like refers to the Irish Hedgerow Schools when they had to have secret schools from the British. Okay, and the purpose of this is I'm going to teach you how to get good at school. This is not some, you know, baby level BS beginner stuff. This is, I'm going to teach you advanced techniques that, you know, make you about 30 IQ points higher. Uh, in terms of your academic performance. This is the real stuff, okay? Real quick, um, I know some of you know me and you've seen some of this before, but I want this also to be for people who don't know me, so I'm gonna have to review a little bit of basic stuff. Here's my father. These guys are all from Ireland. There's his two brothers, grew up on a dirt floor in Ireland, uh, went to the Christian Brothers School. He's a physician, physician. He's an engineer physicist, okay? Here's me, sophomore year of high school as a wrestler. In high school, I've considered myself an athlete. I didn't really pay much attention to school. I never took an honors class, never took an AP class. I didn't even know what an AP class was. My father's from Ireland, poor. My mother's from Ireland. She grew up in a house with a dirt floor, too. They're both dirt poor, didn't know anything about America. Okay, so I had zero advantages in America. Um, I just show you this, though. Wrestling's a good sport, kept me in shape, and I wanted to be like my dad. Children's role models should be their parents. If they have these celebrity role models or, you know, a bunch of crazy people with all kinds of bad behavior. You don't want that. It should be a parent, hardworking parent is the role model. Okay. Um, I got injured in wrestling in the spring of my junior year. And so my senior year, I couldn't wrestle for a while. I kept re-injuring my shoulder. That's me in high school. I went out for a cross country, ran on the cross country team. And we were like one of the best teams in the state. Um, and cross country is good. The cross country runners, they all had the best grades in school. They had the highest SAT scores. A couple of these guys had higher SAT scores than me. And that was a big motivator for me. I'm like, gosh, I would play games with them like, you know, Stratego and Risk and Mastermind. And I'm like, crap, I'm as smart as these guys. How come, you know, they had scored hundreds of points higher than me on the SAT? So I just studied on my own. I retook it several times. Also, real quick, just so you know where I'm at, who I am, what I'm coming from. Here's a book I wrote, Medical Student's Guide to Top Board Scores. I was first in my medical school class. The dean wrote the foreword for it, you know, talking about, you know, my academic achievements and what the book was about. So here's the dean, uh, Robert Wallace, that's in here. Okay, well, anyways, it's in there. Um, and then here's a couple of these things, you know, for being the best student in my medical school class. Dean's List Award, the Lang Book Award. I got tons of academic awards, but just so you have a sense of it, all right? I was student athlete a year at Stanford University. I'm like... Incredibly great student. So just so you know that, who this is coming from, okay? Uh, I'm not talking about getting a B plus at a junior college. I'm talking about being the best student in your medical school class and 99% on med school residency boards. All right. Now, what are some things that will help you? Grade school, high school, and college, it's basically memorization. There's not a lot of thinking going on there. So you want to be good at memorization. This is a great book. It's by Harry Lorraine. It's called Super Memory, Super Student. You also should... You, you learn all the memory techniques, word association techniques, letter number, alphabet, that's all good. Notice that the public schools don't teach the kids memory skills. The public schools don't teach memory skills to the kids and study skills because they don't care about the kid. The Catholic schools don't teach it because they're stupid, okay? But uh, they do try to care about the kids. All right, here's another little trick. See these ear protectors? If you study memory champion competitors, they will wear ear protectors because it reduces distraction. Your brain has a limited amount of cognitive bandwidth processing power and when you minimize distractions you give yourself silence you could think better so you want a quiet room if some people insist on music you can listen to baroque music it has a, a cadence that is okay with thinking like Bach, Arcangelo, Corelli, Vivaldi, Telemann, um, that sort of thing all right so let's go to the next slide now All right, so here's me when I came back. I think this is between my like uh, freshman and sophomore year, or maybe sometime I came home for a little while, and I'm here at my house. And the reason I'm showing you this picture, that's me in college as a wrestler. I was student athlete year at Stanford University. Notice all the books in the back here. Most of these books, I had read them. These are all a bunch of wrestling things mostly that I got, and maybe my brother's football stuff. I played football a little bit when I was young. That was a mistake. I didn't know any better. You don't want to play football. You end up with head trauma. It's, it's not good. I mean, football's a lot of fun. You become real popular at your school, but it's not good for your brain, all right, the head trauma. Luckily, I, didn't, I quit after eighth grade. I knew I was too small uh, to really be any good. I wanted to be good. Okay, anyway, so what I'm trying to say is the point of this slide is you want to read a lot. To be like my dad, I was always reading. And even though I was sort of disillusioned with school at the time of high school, my GPA in high school wasn't that high. 
That's why I don't listen to people who say, oh, it's just IQ, you're either smart or you're not. That's not true. You can make yourself a lot smarter. When I went to Stanford, I was all afraid I was going to flunk out. So I started hanging around with this guy who was a great student. He kind of taught me a bunch of study techniques. But constant reading makes you smarter. When you read a book, you're swimming in words. Okay, so, and I was very proud about having read all these books. I was like, yeah, this is sort of my library. I read these books. I'm like my dad, you know, a student athlete like my dad, tough guy. My dad was a boxer. I was a wrestler, so I kind of thought that was cool at the time. All right, so anyways, that's good for a kid to have that kind of mentality of they're developing themselves, and you got to read a lot. Smart people are readers. That's where all the information is. Okay, let's go to the next slide here. Okay, here I am at Stanford, totally lonely. I went from high school with lots of friends and family around and everything was great to being the loneliest man in the world. I didn't know a single person over there. I was from Chicago, so it sucked from a social point of view. Um, and then all this is my calendar. I was counting every day until my girlfriend would come out to visit me or I was counting every day until I could go home. I was so lonely. I never even knew what it was like to be lonely like that. There was no cell phone in those days. There was no internet. You know, I didn't, I'm shy. I didn't know how to make new friends. All I did was wrestle, study. All right, so, but the good thing was I started hanging out with that guy and he started teaching me how to get good at school. And I'm going to show you some of these technique now, techniques now, though. But the important thing, too, was a phone call I had with my mother. I said, Mom, I hate this place. I'm so lonely. I got injured again. I don't know if I'm going to be able to wrestle this year. My life sucks. I want to come home. I want to transfer to school in Illinois. And she's like, Peter, just give it a try for one year. Just one year. If you don't like it, then you can come home. You can transfer. And I'm like, all right, Mom, I'll do it for you. I love my mother. Okay, and I, whatever she said, I go, okay, mom, I'll do it. And uh, basically, I said, I'm going to be like a learning machine. God, please help me to get good at school. And so I said, you know what, I might not be as smart as these kids, these, all these like prep school kids, rich kids. You know, I'm an Irish Puerto Rican from Chicago. I don't know, Jack, I never took an honors class in high school, all right? And I'm with all these kids that are valedictorians of their high school. So I had to really commit myself. And I just said, I'm going to try so hard. If I failed, because I couldn't do it. But it won't be because I didn't try. I'll drop out of my chair from exhaustion before I, I give up, okay? And then also I looked out the window on the sidewalk and, you know, some kids at the freshman dorm had been drinking the night before. They vomited on the ground to puke. And I was like, good. You guys, you go out, get drunk, have fun, go to your families, okay? You might probably smarter than me, but it don't matter. Well, you're goofing off. I'm going to be studying. I'm going to catch you. I was determined. I'm going to try to do it. Partly it was because I was sad. This is the Alfred Adler inferior order principle whereby... I had screwed up my wrestling career in a sense. I had gotten injured, and I kept trying to come back too soon. I kept getting re-injured. I had a growth plate fracture in my clavicle, and I kept refracturing it and having to take more time off, and then I'd physically get weaker, and I just no longer was a dominant wrestler like I had been before. So, and I was mad at myself. I was like pissed off at myself. You had a great life. You were a great athlete and you ruined it up because you're an idiot because you kept coming back too soon. You stupid jerk. Why did you do that? And my girlfriend called, said she was thinking, wanted to go. If it was okay with me, she'd go to the, the homecoming dance with some other guy. She's a year younger than me. And I'm like, God, does my life suck? You know, I'm afraid I'm going to flunk out. I'm re-injured in my sport. My girlfriend wants to go to a dance with some other guy. Uh, I was pretty miserable. And, you know, sometimes you hit rock bottom and then it's time to bounce back. Okay, so anyway, so make a promise to yourself, make a promise to your God, to your family, whatever it takes, and just put all your energy into that, and that will energize you. So Alfred Adler inferior order principle is to say, well, I'm sad that I screwed something up in my life and I feel inferior about it, but I'm going to try to be successful at something else. It's like sublimation of energy, if you will, and that's also like the Dabronsky theory of personality disintegration and reintegration, whereby our frustration and sadness about failure and disappointment in, in one area leads us to energize ourselves to perform in another area. That's very common on some gifted student community. Okay. Oops. Oh, let me get the right slide here. Here we go. Okay, I want to show you these guys who I met my wrestling coaches. They're really helpful to me. This is Mark Schultz. He was national champion at that time, but he became world and Olympic champion. And what I got from him was... A lot of people didn't like him and were scared of him. And what I noticed was he wouldn't talk much. He wasn't show off at all. He would just keep to himself. But man, when he'd come out on the wrestling mat, he was like Superman. And he would just kick the crap out of everybody. And the fact that he would sometimes not speak to anybody for a week before a competition, he had a low VO2 max, unlike most wrestlers who have a lot of endurance. So he could peak all his energy. And so I said, I want to be like him. 
the kind of guy who don't talk much, but when it's time to perform, man, he performs. Let everybody underestimate me. When I show up, I'm going to be so over-prepared, they're going to be amazed. So he was kind of like one of my heroes because he was also a little bit of an outcast. The head coach at Stanford was sort of a stuck-up California, you know, golden boy, you know, blonde-haired guy. I thought, you know, anybody from the Midwest was stupid. And um, he kind of didn't really like me that much. Was actually thought he wasted a scholarship on me. So anyways, I very much identify with Mark Schultz. Okay. And um, then here's the other guy. This is Mark's brother, Dave Schultz. And he was at freshman, you know, beginning of the wrestling season. He was fat, weak, and kind of slow at running sprints, weak in the weight room, a little bit of fat and out of shape. And I'm like, how did this guy become national champion? Fat, weak, and slow. But he was so good at technique. And I, as a, he, when he was a kid, he was dyslexic. His nickname was Pudge. Other kids picked on him, called him stupid, fat, you know, loser, all that kind of stuff. And then he found that he loved wrestling and he became great at it. He would ride his bike in junior high over to the Pali High, Pali Alto High School, and also to Stanford, which is like across the street practically. So he was training with the college guys even by the time he's in junior high. And in high school, he became the best wrestler ever in the history of the United States in high school. Um, he won the national champion national open. And, and I tell you this because I looked at him and I'm like, how did he do it by getting great at technique? He would want to learn every detail about technique. Why is that relevant to school? Because I said, you know what? I'm going to take his method and I'm going to put it into academics. So what I mean by that incrementalism, I said, I'm going to get as good as I can at taking notes, as good as I can at memorization, as good as I can at preparing for class, as good as I can um, at everything you could learn about study skills, memorization techniques, word tech, uh, word association techniques, condensed note techniques. So I wanted to be a scholar of academics. All right, and I got that idea from him that you could develop your own techniques and methods to become great. This was the wall of fame here. And so, by the way, I'd have to wrestle these guys, you know, all Americans, national champions, world champions every day in practice. I'd get my ass kicked. So I constantly kind of was like, I was the low man on the totem pole, and I was like. Wow, man, it sucks getting my ass kicked every day. Uh, someday I want to be great at something. And it was sort of like, well, maybe I could become a great doctor or scientist. And I sort of hung on to that hope. It was like the light at the end of the tunnel. Someday I could be great at something because I no longer physically, I was trying to catch up to these guys. They were ahead of me now. The guys that I used to beat in high school were like national champions, All-Americans. And so I ended up in high school defeating five All-Americans. But I was not an All-American myself. And that's one of my biggest regrets of my life. So, you know... By being an underdog, low man in wrestling, compared to all my friends, I was very inspired that I'm not going to screw up in academics. I am not going to screw up because I screwed up in wrestling and it made me miserable. I hated my my failure compared to my potential in wrestling. So I said, I'm not going to fail in academics. I'm not going to let that happen. It's, it's not going to happen unless I just can't do it. But I will give every last ounce of energy I have to, to do it. Well, I'm just showing you this one picture. I think tennis is a good sport, too. You, it builds good hand-eye coordination. This is my old house. I love my old house. It's a long story. I've talked about it elsewhere, how I ended up having to move to a new stupid house. But I love this place. That's another screw-up in my life. I should have stayed there. All right. All right, so here's a picture of me in medical school. Here's the book I, I just showed you a moment ago, Medical Student's Guide to Top Board Scores. I had been first in my class. I was, like, just about the best, if not the best, biochemistry student in the whole United States. Um... Go to the next slide here. Okay, here's a learning curve. I got this idea from that Tim Ferriss guy. He's a pretty clever guy. He's real good at marketing, certainly. This is what it's like to learn most subjects. When you first start out learning it, it's all exciting and fun. You kind of envision yourself becoming great at whatever the topic is, and you just see the highlights of the field, and that's a lot of fun, and, you know, it, it, it gets you motivated, okay? So then... You start hitting a plateau, and you just have to grind out a lot of the tedious stuff, much of it boring. A lot of times the teacher will suck, and you're just sort of hanging in there, barely hanging out, but you have to do it. Get through that long, tedious grind. And then what happens is all of a sudden you've got some competence, and now you can perform in the real world. So you get a lot of experience, and you rapidly improve again, and that's fun. But then you start saying, okay, well, now I've done everything in terms of learning the average competence. But if you're interested in the field, you'll keep pushing yourself to learn. And again, it gets a little tedious. But here's what's cool about it is if you just stay on the conventional path, this would be like somebody becomes a doctor and they just go through the motions and do whatever they have to to generate their billing codes, make their money, but they don't really pay much attention. They just follow all the standard protocols. 
versus here's what I would call the really exciting path. Like when I look at brain MRIs, I'm trying to figure the thing out. I'm not just trying to read it in five seconds and, you know, generate a billing code. I'm trying to understand what is really going on with this patient. Why does their brain look this way? And what I found was that ended up making it a lot more exciting and fun. And so I love it when I talk to some of my smart neurology, neuroradiology buddies or ear, nose and throat surgery buddies. And we really discuss the complexities of these, ca these cases. That's a lot of fun because uh, I finally, after all these years, gotten really good at it. Uh, but anyways, what I'm trying to say is you got to pay your dues and it's a long haul to become great at a complex intellectual thing. And like uh, Goethe, the, the German philosopher, scholar, scientist had said, in order for a man to learn a complex subject, he must love it. Because you got to be all over it and get every detail and it takes a lot of time. And I realize not everybody's going to love what they do, but initially push yourself before you understand it and then eventually you can learn to love it. Or, you know, maybe it won't, it won't be for you, but, but whatever you're learning will be a stepping stone to other things. All right. I'm going to get into a lot of nitty-gritty study skills, but just I'm showing you some of this basic stuff because it'll it'll build the, the the base for you to understand everything else. This is just the brain, and this is a sagittal midline picture showing the cerebral spinal fluid in yellow. The blue is the veins, the, you know, the sagittal sinus up here, inferior sagittal sinus here, and straight sinus. And the point of all this is just that at night, your brain cleans itself. Your brain goes offline. Your brain cannot go offline in the daytime to clean itself because the neurons need to have precise ionic gradients along their outer surface so they can fire action potentials. So you have to have a precise ionic milieu. And only at night when you're asleep can the brain go offline, open up the blood-brain barrier, and the cerebral spinal fluid will rinse through the brain parenchyma, the brain tissue, and the neurons will pump out their waste products and the cerebral spinal fluid rinses it away. This is called the glymphatic system and then it's reabsorbed into the venous circulation. You need to let your brain clean itself at night. You gotta sleep. So whatever it takes, make sure you're getting enough sleep. That's super important to make yourself smarter and to consolidate your memories, lock them in the long term, okay? In general, most people need to go to bed earlier. That's a key thing. Because you're smartest in the morning, right, when you wake up because your brain is clean and also because when is an animal smartest? When it's hungry, it has to go find food. You have break fast. You fasted overnight since you last ate dinner the previous day. So you get a little, just enough of cortisol. A little bit of cortisol is good. You get ghrelin from the stomach, G for ghrelin, G for gastric. Goes to the hippocampus, sort of activates those neurons. That's the smartest you'll ever be. So the other rule is as soon as you wake up in the morning, don't do anything else. Sit down and start studying. Um, because you can do your most complex work. Whatever I have to do most complicated, I always do that first thing in the morning. That's your maximum intellectual performance. And that's why I like waking up early in the morning. Because let's say my brain starts getting tired about 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, then if I get up a little earlier, and I'm older. Older people are more comfortable getting up early. But if I get up at 5 a.m., I'm smart until about 2 p.m. Versus if I get up at 8.30, I'm still smart until about 2 p.m. So I like getting up earlier as long as I go to bed earlier. And you have to decide, you know, what your current situation is. I remember when I was in college, I hated waking up early. I actually was pissed off that I had to take a class at 8 o'clock in the morning. I said to myself, this is so ridiculous. Why does a college have a class at 8 o'clock? There's no college student that wants to go to class at 8 a.m. That's far too early. That's, that's how I used to think at that age. Young people, you know, they like to sleep in later. I don't know. There might be something biologic about that. Okay, here's a picture. Um, I'm going to show you some study techniques now. This is when I was in taking my neuroradiology boards. Um, I was married at this time. This was like the basement bathroom of my old house. And of course, my wife was less than thrilled about this. But some of the things I used to do here is I had to take neuroradiology boards and I would put pictures of all this neuroanatomy, um, detailed stuff. These are, you know, CAT scans and there's some MRIs in here somewhere and all these anatomical drawings like the Netter Atlas. And um, I had made a table that you just slide over with your foot. And I would often read textbooks when I was um, doing a number one, number two over there. During a number one, I'd often read paperbacks. I had this actual table in here as well. I actually have an audio CD player just outside the room I listen to audio books with. Um, I would put people who were my heroes on here. Hey, actually, by the way, if you look right there, that's uh, Dr. Esselstyn. That was one of my academic heroes. Um, and others, you know, I loved Victor Hugo. I loved the com comedian Rodney Dangerfield. So... People who inspired me, I would put their pictures up on the wall. And then I'd have somebody like Aristotle is on here. Um, there's uh, this lady, Loam. She's like this genius of learning languages. She was one of my heroes too. So anyways, because you see your heroes every day and you're inspired. You want to be like them. That's a good thing. That's always been something in, in history that people have had inspiring older persons who they looked up to. And you just see them and it reminds you, gosh, I want to be like them. I got to work harder. Okay. 
All right, so here's some more pictures. This is one of my other houses I later moved to. Again, this portable table in front of the, the toilet there. Paperback I was reading. That's actually Mark Schultz's Foxcatcher book, A Wrestling. And here, I'd always have some big textbook. It's entertainment in that location. There's nothing else to do. Um, and here's just showing more of the pictures there in, in my bathroom there. My wife, you know, hated the bathroom. She thought it was like I was destroying the property value. But, you know, I was, in, I was off in the basement, so no one else ever went down there. But, uh... Okay, now here's a really useful thing. This is a flashcard system. And this is called a SIRS, Spaced Interval Repetition System, SIRS. You want to know about this. I didn't really start using flashcards until I was a little older. I wish I had started using them in college. Spaced Interval Repetition means that, for example, I got four boxes here. The first one is where you put the cards, then you look at it, and if you instantly, automatically know it, then you advance it to the next box. If you hesitate at all, it stays in the first box. And then you look at it later on from the second box. If you instantly know it, it goes to this box and then finally to the completion box. And the point is that the stuff that's easy, you'll instantly recognize and it quickly gets to the completion box. The stuff that's challenging, you'll have to repeat, look at it multiple times. So it gets you to spend more time with the material that is difficult for you and not waste time looking at your notes over and over again. A typical student highlights their notes, looks at their text, hope I recognize this on the test. And that's not really what you want to do. You want to be able to repeat everything out loud. I, I do a walk and tech, a walk and talk. I'll show you about that later. You can use electronic flashcards. There's, there's like Anki is a good brand for that. There's other brands for that. I used to like to make stuff in paper, you know, that I could really hold on to. What if you lose internet access? What if your computer crashes? It's nice to have stuff in paper. I know the modern generation, they always walk around with their phones, but believe me, IQs are lower than ever before. They're not higher. So I'm not, I'm not that impressed by the methods of the younger generation, them walking around with their cell phones all the time like idiots. A lot of them put it in their front pocket and they microwave their balls or they ha they have it next to their head or they sleep near their head. That's all stupid. All right, now I'm going to show you some more advanced stuff. Okay, first thing I'm going to show you is I'll show you what I did for neuroradiology. I took this book here and I put all the pictures. I wanted everything in one spot. So I would tape all these pictures in of complex neuroanatomy and I put tons of my own notes in the margins. Like here's an example of tons of my own notes. Can you see that? Yeah, right there. Okay. So what I was trying to accomplish was, you know, it becomes crunch time the last, you know, let's say six weeks before a test, especially the last two weeks for a test. So I wanted everything in one spot. So I call this illustrated condensed notes. It's condensed in the sense that all my information is in one spot. This is for my neuroradiology boards. After I finished my neuroradiology boards, the examiner said, your performance was extraordinary. Where are you from? Where did you train? How did you study for the exam? He told my examiner that I had gotten a perfect score on his section of the neuroradiology boards. That's an oral exam though, so there was no score. Medical and residency, I got 99%. So I know school really well at school. I wish I was good at other things in life as I was at school. Okay, um, here's though, this is I think the most important one. Let me show you this one. This is what I use for my, this is what I use for my condensed notes for radiology residency. It's like a four, four and a half hour test. I was done, and that's only the top 15% of medical students, and I was done in an hour, 10 minutes with a perfect score. And so I'm gonna show you what I did. It's all in an outline format. Because it's an outline format, what that means is you can find everything quickly. Also, you want something where there's an index at the back of the book. Remember, what this is is comprehensive systematic memorization of tremendous volumes of material, okay? By having it all in one book, I could always find everything fast. I actually had another copy of the book that I brought to uh, to the hospital for when we have conferences. And I would look stuff up at conferences, and I'd make a note of the page number, and then I'd go back to this book when I would come home and I would study. Um, I also made summaries of all the mnemonics. If you look in here up close, you'll see I have all these mnemonics, which are memory tricks. I made hundreds of them. Gosh, I don't know how many are in here if I numbered them. I don't know if I numbered them. I numbered some of them. I'm, I'm looking here at 140, 150, 160 something. So 170. So I made mnemonics, 190. I made hundreds of them. Okay, it's, it's still going up. I made all these mnemonics for all these diseases because that would help you to, to memorize them. And to make mnemonics, I would make the mnemonics simpler than what I was trying to remember. So they're typically acronyms where you go by the first letter of something tells you, uh, you know, triggers your mind to remember it. Um, so I try to make them simple. They had to be easier than what I was trying to remember. And I made tons of them. And then, so I, I could know all this stuff. Um, so you want to use mnemonics. I use them for everything. And also lots of word association. So that stuff was really helpful to me. Uh, I'm showing you another trick that was real helpful. 
And <clears throat> so some of the things we talked about here, you got to have desire to become great at school. Then you have to do the work. But then you want these good study skills. Um, the next thing was, for example, you're going to take Spanish. Like I loved all the Spanish music, okay? And so I, I made this song and I have all the songs that I liked. And I have the English and the Spanish on there so I could review the two of them together, the English and the Spanish. Because what I got out of studying this, the, the bilingual songs, the English and the Spanish versions was, and I also have these, these tabs so I can find the songs fast, is the emotion of Spanish. You know, if you just do school, all they teach is grammar. But you start reading books, having conversations, listening to music, and having both sets of the words and stuff where you can understand all the words, you get a sense of the emotion of the language, okay? Nowadays, too, I'll show you some of the techniques I use nowadays is I sometimes use post-its on top of the page. Sometimes I just dog ear the page, you know, fold the corner back. We call that the dog ear a page. Um, if I want to go back to the page when I read a book, I'll also sometimes summarize my notes in the back of the book. Like in the back of the book, I'll, I'll summarize it as I'm reading the book so I can later on go back to the page numbers or the really good stuff. And then I'll often, like this book is a fantastic, it's one of the best medical books ever written, High Blood Pressure Solution by Richard Moore, MD. If I go back about the book, I'll give lectures on it, I'll teach other people about it, I'll talk to my doctor friends about it, you know, about managing hypertension, I'll talk to other friends about managing hypertension, and then I'll give lectures on it, and sometimes I'll go back and I'll put tabs on the bottom of the book. See, here's the top of the book, first time I read it, and then bottom of the book is the, thing that, the things that I think are extra good that I might want to include when I give a lecture or if I write a book chapter on the subject. Um, so those are other study methods that I found helpful. And, and the other thing too, you want to pre-read. Like if I'm going to a lecture and it's a, a class that's important to me, like I love biochemistry, but it was hard for me at first when I was in college. And I was intimidated by these biochemistry professors. I mean, they do it for a living. They know biochemistry really well. So I um, wanted to do better. I, I actually knew this guy. And uh, his name was Chuck Kinder. He was first in his class uh, a year ahead of me or two years ahead of me. And so I asked him, how did you do it? And he said, well, here's what you got to do. You got to pre-read the night before you go to class. You'll be smarter and get the old notes if you can get them. So I would spend a lot of time reading. I had like three, four versions of the biochemistry textbook, you know, different, uh, ver different editions of biochemistry textbooks. And I would look at them, different biochemistry textbooks. And I would say like, what is the essential thing here that unifies all this information. What is the irreducible minimum from which I can derive everything? Let's say I'm looking at glycolysis. That's the first uh, metabolic pathway in carbohydrate metabolism. And I would look at it, look at it, look at it, and I go, I got it, it's the phosphate. So then I would just memorize the location of the phosphate. And once I did that, I got the cycle. Other times I would just memorize the first letter and the name of all the, you know, the substrates and reactants okay, and, and the products. Okay, something like that. Whatever it would be, looking at a couple different books, you get it. Looking at the old notes. Then I would go into class. I'd sit right in the front row and I would make it a game with the professor. I would act like I was a goalie and I'm like playing hockey with the professor and they're trying to, they don't, I don't want them to get anything past me. And I would even psych myself up. I'd say, ah, you're old, I'm young, I'm the future, you're the past. I was trying to get myself psychologically pumped up to soak up the whole lecture because before I would only understand about, you know, 15, 20% of a biochemistry lecture and I had to spend all my time studying the rest of it. And I wanted to get where I could walk into a biochemistry lecture really well prepared, know all the vocabulary so I could take really good notes and make it almost like a review from all the studying I had done the day before. And once I started doing that, I started being able to really absorb most of a biochemistry lecture. Yeah, of course I'd have to go back and study some more, but I started to really understand a lot. I also sit right in the front row. I don't want any distraction. All these kids are goofing off, talking to each other and stuff. No, I'm in the front row, just between me and the teacher. And you you, you catch every nuance when you're sitting in that lecture hall right in the front. Never miss a class. Uh, my first year, I had to commute a bit, and I hated it. I sometimes oversleep the first class. That was bad, okay? I got the shock of my life, too. When I went to, I went to University of Illinois for medical school. So I go to my midterms, and I'm expecting I'll be the best student in the class. And I ended up being like 10th percentile. And I'm like, how the heck... Could I, the big dog from Stanford academically, end up 10th percentile at a state school? What is going on? I was so pissed off. I didn't understand it. And then when I found out, I'm sitting at the cafeteria about you know a week or two later, and these two uh, University of Illinois kids that went to Urbana, Illinois undergrad, they're like, oh yeah, last semester I took histology and physiology. And I'm like, there's the answer right there. I'm over at Stanford doing all these research classes, studying all this animal evolutionary biology, you know, counting the number of mitochondria in a bug's ass, while they were studying all the classes that they were going to retake when they were in med school. So they had taken all the classes before, whereas I hadn't taken anything except biochemistry before. So once I realized they just simply had a lot more experience with the material, 
then I, I knew I would do better and I, and I eventually did much better. But that's what happened. So yeah, whenever something surprises you, figure out what happened so you can correct the problem. Okay, here's what I call a walk and talk. So a walk and talk means that you walk around. Actually, here I'm walking and reading. What I would really do is I would put the book down and I would just walk around and say the whole thing out loud. Like let's say it was biochemistry. It'd be, I'd say to myself, glucose first comes into the cell. It's phosphorylated by glucokinase or hexokinase enzyme. And once it's got a, phosphor, a phosphate group on it, now it's got this big charge on it. It can't go back out through the plasma membrane. And then it undergoes the next reaction. It gets transformed into fructose 6-phosphate. Then it gets another phosphate added to it, becomes fructose 1,6-diphosphate. Okay, so what I, the reason I'm saying that is if you can say the whole metabolic pathway out loud, then you know it pretty well. And you got a copy of it in your hearing center, your speaking center, so to speak. You're more familiar with the material. And I would often do that walking around talking to myself. Uh, later on when I do this around my family, they would all make fun of me. You said, you autistic crazy person, why are you talking to yourself? And uh, I'm just like, you know, I'm studying right now. Leave me alone, all right? Um, the other thing, too, I would sometimes say affirmations to myself. I'd get myself psyched up. You know, you can do it. You can do it. I'd talk to myself like that. And so then they would start teasing me and imitating me. But it didn't really matter. I know this works. Because if you only look at your book, you're kind of insecure. You're scared. I hope I recognize everything when I take a test. If you've put your book down and you've walked around, you can recite the entire biochemical cycle, all the, you know, the substrates, the products, the enzymes, you know, the ATP production numbers and stuff. You're confident. I'd go to sleep confident. I'm like, I know this stuff. I know this stuff probably better than the teacher. So you sleep well, show up for the test. I never did an all-nighter. None of this crap. I never did an all-nighter. I never drank caffeine. I never took a pill. I never even drank caffeine in my life until I was in residency. And that was a mistake I wish I never had. So what I'm trying to say is when you prepare well and you know what you're doing, you feel good, you sleep good. And, and another thing too is I wasn't just trying to get a grade. I wanted to become a great doctor or scientist. And what that meant was when you take a class, most students, they take a class and they forget almost everything versus I would take a class and I would remember a lot of it. Not all of it, but I'd remember a lot of it. So I take the next class and I was starting off with an advantage. And the more time went by, the bigger advantage I had. And it wasn't like, oh, I was just good at biochemistry. No, I got myself where I could memorize or learn anything they could put in front of me. And I was like, I don't care what the class is. I expect to be the best student in the class. And I wasn't always the best student in the class. I was always very close, if not the best. And I was the best overall. But what I'm trying to say is you get a lot of confidence in your academic abilities when you've developed them that way. And if you play the game for the long haul, this is just some of my academic stuff. Yeah, my SAT, when I, I took SAT three times and it went up, up, and up. Just realize it's a memorization contest. The more you study, the more you memorize, the better you get at. Okay, uh, now here's another thing. I think I think I showed you all this stuff. And I showed you the earplugs for getting a quiet room. Later on in my mid-30s, I became a little fat and then I had to lose all the way. It took me a couple years. McDougal's idea of focusing on starch was actually quite helpful to me. Um, I was a star McDougaler on the McDougal site as well. But here's one of the textbooks I wrote. I offered a textbook in imaging guided surgery there in interventional. So anyways, I show you this stuff because if you as a student and you as a parent, you want your kid to be good at school, don't just bug them to read books. If you bug them, they're not going to want to read. What you do is show the pleasure in it, be a good example yourself, and let them learn to enjoy it. Let the kid read whatever they want. If you force the kid to read something, they're gonna hate it. I used to buy my kids books when they were young and they almost never read anything that I bought for them. Then I learned you have to let them pick the book. So I'd go with the kid to the library or to the bookstore, let them pick the book, or later on, let them pick it from an internet bookstore, and then they would read the book. So learning should be a joyful thing. When you think about it, learning in the real world actually is an enjoyable thing. Like when you're a wrestler, you wanna learn that technique so you can win your next match. You remember that technique because that could, you know, save your butt. You'll, you'll defeat your opponent. And things that are really useful, you remember. You remember what you learn in driver's ed, okay? And so what I'm trying to say is most school is stupid. You know, they'll just give you a list of vocabulary words to memorize. That's stupid because you memorize it for the test and you forget everything. What's the point of that? That's like the intellectual equivalent. William Glasser, this great teacher, said this. He's a great psychiatrist, academic teacher. He said, that's like telling somebody to dig a ditch and then fill it back in with dirt. It's stupid. It's a waste of their time. The best way to learn stuff is to use it. And that's why it's also good to read books and have conversations. It should be a highly respected thing to read books and have conversations. If you look around at the smartest people, you're going to see this is a very characteristic thing. When they were young, they would read books and discuss them with adults. And it could be the religious books of their culture and tradition. It could be whatever 
is popular in their group, but they are reading books and discussing it. And because I used to do that with my dad, I was, you know, very scared when I was at Stanford that I was going to flunk out. I got all B's, B minuses my first quarter grades. But then once I started figuring out, I was like, wow, I got an advantage on these kids. I love reading and talking about books. Most of these kids are just trying to get a good grade. And there's a difference between the person who's trying to really become good and who really wants to be good and who's really trying to learn and understand versus the person who's just trying to get a grade. The point being is I just kept improving and improving and other kids were sort of stagnant. And I think that's a big part of it. And you become more verbally sophisticated. And when you read a book, you're swimming in words. I mean, every page, there's tons of words. If you're doing this all the time, you get good with words. Um, for mathematics, you got to do tons of problems and just figure out a way to do them. Make flashcards or whatever. Um, be aware that you could really dramatically up your performance. Like I said, I ended up being like the worst of the cross-country runners in, on the SAT. Not the worst of them, but there was like about three, four guys who were better than me. But by the end, if I took the test three times, I think I scored higher than all of them. And that was how I did it. Um, so know that you can improve dramatically and try to do it. And respect academics. Nice thing about academics is you could use your brain every day. You do have to every day the rest of your life. It's an enjoyable thing to get better educated, to increase your ability to do different things. You know, a lot of stuff that kids are so obsessed about when they're young, they can't do them when they're older. You know, it's a lot of fun to wrestle, but I can't wrestle anymore. I don't have any place to wrestle. And I got a little bit of a shoulder problem. I can wrestle a little bit and I can wrestle like on my knees and stuff against my nephew who's a senior in high school, but I'm not like I used to be, okay? You got to do it all the time. And a lot of other sports, football or other sports, you know, you need a whole big team. You can't do that stuff versus you use your brain every day, you continue to use it, and the learning pays off. Musical instruments are also good, learning how to draw. But anyways, all I'm trying to say is study skills make a tremendous difference. I went from being scared I'm going to flunk every class, you know, happy to just get a B in a science class to, you know, my second year I'd get A pluses and the most difficult stuff, you know, the weed out biology classes, the organic chemistry. And I had this confidence once I got it, you know, I'd walk in the room, I was just like, I'm going to dominate this class. I just know it. I could hear the kids talking around me. I would know that I was way ahead of them academically. And that was a nice feeling to have that confidence. And so what I'm saying is there was no change in my brain. There was no intrinsic genetic IQ change. I just had learned how to study. So hope that helps you.